Hello, everybody, and uh, happy St. Patrick's Day. This is Mike Kramer, Calibration Program Manager at Perry Johnson Laboratory Accreditation, and I'm delighted uh, today to uh, do this month's presentation on behalf of Perry Johnson Laboratory Accreditation. Um, as you can see uh, um, from the uh, title of this slide, today's topic is going to be nonconforming test and calibration work what it is and what are the requirements. And this is uh, specifically going to pertain to Section 4.9 of uh, ISO 17025, uh, 2005. Um, so as always, uh, I always uh, uh, pull this slide up here. This is being recorded. Um, hence, uh, if you uh, have if you feel uh, you want to go back and re-listen to it uh, on the PJLA website, uh, we do have a link under Resources, Training, uh, Recorded Webinars, um, where you can listen to this one. Plus, we have a vast array of uh, webinars that we have presented over the last couple of years. Um, if you, you see any other topic of, of interest, uh, feel free to uh, check out the website. So uh, going right into uh, today's topic, uh, nonconforming test and calibration work. What is it? Uh, uh, nonconforming test or calibration would occur if any aspects of the organization's testing or calibration work or the results of works do not conform to the organization's own procedures or the agreed requirements of the customer. So uh, what it is, uh, and this, these uh, notes come from uh, directly from a uh, current version of 17025. And um, notes are given to provide clarification of the text, give examples and guidance. So a note uh, directly in the uh, body of 17025 within section uh, 4.9 states, identification of nonconforming work or problems with the management system or with testing and or calibration activities can, can occur at various places within the management system and technical operations. Examples could be from customer complaints, quality control, instrument calibrations, check-in of consumable materials, staff observations or supervision, test reports and calibration certificates checking, uh, management review or internal air, excuse me, internal or external audits can um, uh, have uh, of uh, instances where non-conforming uh, testing or calibration work could surface. So again, a non-conformance uh, in regards to testing and calibration work is a deviation from an established protocol plan, such as, and I'm going to give some some examples of here of uh, here on the next couple slides of uh, where um, non-conforming calibration and uh, testing could rear its ugly head. Um, so uh, it could come from failure of resources such as personnel, equipment, facilities, work instructions to meet performance requirements or other specified requirements. It could come from failure of personnel to comply with documented work instructions or operational procedures. It could come from failure of test, test data to meet required standards. And this can be due to an array of things, which I have listed here. Failure or suspected failure to meet all conditions necessary to ensure the integrity and representatives, excuse me, representatives of the sample, um, such as uh, sample histories, deficiencies exist. Uh, failure or suspected, specific, or suspected failures to comply with the test methods, SOP. Uh, failure in the method performs as demonstrated by results provided by quality control samples. 
i.e., uh, you may have some samples worked into some controlled samples worked in, into your test. Uh, things like blanks, um, other things that uh, are um, put into play when you're um, testing samples um, if you are a testing lab. Um, another example could be inherent property of a sample that compromises the testing. Ah, moving along, uh, a source is also the uh, calibration of the equipment. Uh, standards are equipment that um, would, would um, be sent out or calibrated at your fixed facility. So uh, this is uh, probably one of the more common um, non-conforming testing or calibration that, that I see as an assessor. So uh, what this is specifying here, and I have an example here. Um, and if you recall um, in section 4, 6 in purchasing, um, there's requirements when you, uh, of course, when you um, purchase supplies, you have approved vendors and suppliers, and then when you receive them, they have to be inspected. Um, could be uh, for uh, specific properties, um, for reagents, uh, could be a specific grades or whatever. When, when those uh, products or services are completed, um, you need to inspect them and, and be assured you got what you um, what you in fact ordered. Um, so for calibration, typically what that's going to be is a calibration report. Um, hence, um, if you send a device, and this is an example of a looks like a humidity indicator, uh, just a, a body portion of a calibration certificate, um, and uh, so when in this particular instance, the uh, if you were the uh, testing or calibration lab, this would need to be inspected, i.e., for a couple reasons. One would be for traceability. So if this was needed for traceability purposes, of course, you're going to assure that those requirements were met. The other thing is when when instruments or uh, standards artifacts are sent in for calibration, you typically would get as found and as left data. Um, as found, and I like to call this also as used, is actually how the equipment was found prior to being calibrated. So in other words, that is how you were actually using the equipment before it actually uh, got into the hands of the um, calibration um, lab, and um, hence the, that data is recorded, so as found. Um, and then he has left is how they left it. Uh, many instruments uh, could be adjusted. If the instrument was out of tolerance, uh, um, i.e. a pipette, for example, a scale or balance, um, whatever it happens to be, uh, calibration labs can typically go in and adjust those, those instruments and bring them back within tolerance. That's great. So when it comes back to you, uh, you, you, you see that it passes the as found. Um, you're you're good to go. Start using that uh, equipment or artifact. However, if the as found was found out of tolerance, that's something that needs to be um, to, needs to be investigated. So, in other words, that means you were using the equipment when it was out of tolerance. I.e., this procedure for non-conforming calibration and testing would apply for in this instance. Uh, therefore. Um, Let's say, for example, you had the uh, instrument on a one-year calibration interval. You had really no intermediate checks on this piece of equipment. So hence, it comes back and you notice the edge found data was out of tolerance. Whatever they happen to be, it could even be customer-specified tolerance. So how far back do you need to go? Unless you have an intermediate check on the equipment, as far as you know, it could have gone out of tolerance the day you got it back uh, from the previous cal, or it could have gone to call, going out of calibration the um, uh, day before you sent it off. Hence, you have a uh, year's worth of uh, investigations to do, unless you had something in place, i.e., uh, control charts, uh, uh, proficiency test, or, or something other that could uh, pick up uh, when performing an intermediate check when the device may have drifted. So again, I just want to emphasize um, whenever these reports come in, 
You want to make sure that uh, they were in tolerance. You also want to perhaps look and see how far they were from being out of tolerance and uh, may have to be justification on um, uh, reducing the calibration interval. All right, I'm going to go right on into uh, the requirements now. Uh, and uh, those of you that were um, involved uh, with last month's presentation, which was, uh, as uh, you may or may not know, 17025 is up for revision. Um, it's fairly, I would say, fairly certain that it's going to be done by December of this year. Uh, that was last month's webinar. I did look at the uh, last committee draft I had in regards to this particular section, and it appears to be that uh, this has been untouched. So basically, the uh, what's what's currently in the committee draft is you have to have a procedure, and the procedure has to ensure, and basically all the requirements, which is in 2005, are in the proposed 2017 version. So um, hence, uh, if you're transitioning, or a new lab coming on board, whatever I'm going through here in regards to non-conforming calibration and testing work appears to be crosswalked over to the new standard. So uh, we're in 2005 now. Again, uh, like I said my disclaimer from reference to the upcoming uh, revision is that it's not a final, the final document yet. It's still um, going through review approval process and uh, things are subject to change. So currently 491, the laboratory shall have a policy and procedure that shall be implemented when any aspect of its testing and or calibration work or the results of this work do not conform with its own procedures or agreed requirements of the customers. So uh, I took something from my internal auditing presentation. Uh, when, you, uh, when something is to be done, a pol you look for a policy. When you find a policy, you look for a procedure by which it is implemented. And so that is what 491 is specifying in regards to uh, non-conforming testing calibration work. Again, non-conforming work is any occurrence that deviates from the established criteria, policies, or procedures. Okay, I mentioned uh, the policy and procedure has to ensure, and there's a list of items. So uh, uh, item number A currently is the responsibilities and authorities for the management of non-conforming work are designated in actions, which could include the halting of work and withholding of testing calibration certificates as necessary or defined and when non-conforming calibration work is identified. So in other words, the laboratory must designate who has the authority to identify non-conforming work, to halt work, and to take the necessary action. Um, depending on the size of the organization, this does not have to be a single person. It may have a hierarchy. For example, uh, technicians may be given the authority to identify and address analytical quality control, whereas the authority to address more serious non-conformances such as reporting of bad results, may be limited to more senior management. Uh, realize for small organizations, uh, you may have a, a, a two or three person uh, calibration lab. In that, that case, uh, this all may be uh, uh, a responsibility of, of one individual, regardless of the severity of the conforming work. Okay, uh, item number B, the policy and procedure shall ensure that an evaluation of the significance of the non-conforming work is made. So in other words, did the non-conforming work, whatever it happens to be, impact any testing or calibration results submitted to the customer? Uh, item I like to, uh, excuse me, a uh, um, phrase I like to refer to is reverse traceability. Um, so in other words, in the realm of um, non-conforming testing calibration work, this is the source of the non-conformance is direct, and then it's directed to a specific piece of equipment, standard, or reference material. Could also be an individual um, that was used to perform the to, to produce customers' uh, reports. Hence, um, let's take uh, 
piece of equipment, for example, um, if it was a, a test weight, if it was a pipette, uh, handsome, if it was out, that uh, out of tolerance condition needs to be investigated. Uh, hence, uh, reverse traceability would be every uh, artifact or sample that that uh, weight or pipette was used, that was used um, to uh, produce the, your customer's calibration or test reports would need to be looked at. And if the, 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 signific the significance of the nonconformance, did it actually impact the results that were submitted would need to be looked at and evaluated. Okay, uh, the policy and procedure shall ensure that C, correction is taken immediately, together with any decision about the acceptability of the non-conforming work. So uh, correction, so that's sort of short term. That's put a band-aid on the situation. A correction is something that uh, remediates the immediate problem and is something that occurs shortly after the non-conformance is identified. Uh, correction is a medial action, correcting the nonconformity. We're going to look at an example a little bit later here. So I'll go through the requirements now, and uh, we're going to look at uh, an example, and hopefully we'll clarify what the immediate uh, correction is, as opposed to, if needed, what the long-term corrective action would be. So when the investigation proves that the nonconformance exists, the procedure should lead into a into the formal corrective action procedure as defined in section 411. The procedure shall also define the process by which a laboratory will process the non-conforming work. Whether is it acceptable um, or the test or calibration will need to be repeated. Again, uh, corrective is a medial. Long-term corrective action is an investigate related to the process as simple as to determine actually the root calls and hopefully eliminate uh, the nonconformance from uh, reoccurring. Okay, the policy and procedure shall ensure that D, where necessary, the customer is notified and work is, call, is recalled. Hence, we did our investigation. Um, if uh, we pinpointed uh, customers that, that it actually impacted, uh, they need to be notified and if needed, the work recalled. So when the disposition of nonconforming work requires, uh, the laboratory shall notify the client and recall the work. However, um, it is critical to realize that not all nonconformances will require notification of the client. If the investigation uh, indicates that the particular nonconformance does not affect the result and that the client has no, notific no notification is necessary. Hence, um, uh, if I was an assessor uh, and it was an instance where uh, nonconforming calibration or testing work was performed, I'd be looking for the investigation. And then um, what was determined on, uh, what, what, how was it determined whether or not uh, the particular nonconformance, whether it was the out of condition, uh, excuse me, the out of tolerance condition of a, a piece of equipment that was calibrated or uh, perhaps quality uh, control charts being, being uh, um, out of limits. Um, what was used to determine whether or not it impacted the customer's results. And if it did actually impact, then um, hence uh, uh, customers being notified and if necessary, the work recalled. Okay, the policy and procedure shall ensure that their responsibility for authorizing the resumption of work is defined. Um, so, in other words, an individual, uh, typically uh, the quality manager um, or designee, is responsible for authorizing the resumption of work. 
Uh, hopefully this individual would be independent of the cause of the occurrence of the non-conforming worm. So what it is stating, uh, let's say uh, you had some equipment that uh, uh, was uh, getting, giving suspected results. Uh, you took correction, um, i.e. perhaps uh, had the equipment repaired, um, had it recalibrated. Somewhere, somehow, so somebody along the line has to give the thumbs up that, uh, okay, this situation has been corrected. The, um, it is now okay to proceed with testing or calibration um, um, work utilizing this piece of equipment. So in other words, once the nonconformance is corrected, someone has to somebody has to be identified as the person to authorize the resumption of work. And just to alliterate uh, corrective action again, uh, 492. Uh, when the evaluation indicate that non-conforming work could reoccur or that there is doubt about the compliance of the laboratory's operation with its own policies and procedure, the corrected action procedure given in 411 shall be promptly followed. So in other words, if we took correction, uh, maybe uh, uh, had her take a uh, short term, remove a piece of equipment uh, um, out of service uh, or do some retraining, whatever it happens to be, if it's uh, indicated that this could possibly repeat itself or that the organization has determined um, that they are not uh, complying with their own policies and procedures, then hence uh, corrective action needs to be followed. In other words, uh, 411, a root cause analysis uh, would need to be completed and corrective action taken to identify the root cause, get at the root of the issue, hopefully at the, dig down to the roots uh, to get to the reason why the nonconformance occurred and if uh, eliminated, will, if eliminated, will significantly diminish the likelihood of reoccurrence. So uh, um, that is it as far as the requirements within uh, Section 491725. Uh, um, got, an, got an example here, sort of going to walk through. It's a simplified example, but I think it uh, uh, gives, looks at all the uh, requirements we went through and uh, hopefully uh, sheds some clarification if there uh, um, are any um, questions out there concerning the requirements that we just went through. So the example I have is uh, in this situation, we have an analytical balance uh, is being checked with a 100 gram weight. Uh, this is a scenario um, uh, on a weekly basis and logged into equipment logbook. This is done each Monday of the first day of the work week by a technician who on a rotating basis fulfills the role as lead technicians and run checks on all lab balances on that day. Hence, the lab, this, this particular organization has a protocol for intermediate checks of their analytical balance. Uh, on this particular balance in this scenario, predefined limits at 100 grams is set between 99.9995 grams to 100.000.5 grams. In other words, plus or minus, it looks like uh, 0.5 milligrams. Um, is specified on this particular balance, which is used in LISI testing. Uh, the lab manager in reviewing the lab book uh, saw last reading was 99.9991 grams um, and was recorded by technician John Doe. As we have a non-conforming, uh, we have a non-conformance here. Uh, uh, this, uh, this results uh, uh, were um, out of uh, predefined limits and testing was still performed using this balance even though this intermediate check indicated that the balance was not operating within specified limits. The lab manager re-verified the standard uh, with his standard class one test weight and recorded a reading of 99.9989 grams. And red flags are going off here. 
The lab manager who has authorized, instituted the control of non-conforming work procedure to be implemented. So in this particular scenario, an evaluation, of course, was done. And this would be for all work that was done. In this particular case, we're looking at a week um, um, since the, the balance was last determined to be operated within predefined limits. So an evaluation indicated that the nonconformance was made, and it was determined that five tests were performed using that balance since, the, since it was last determined as operating within predefined acceptable limits. Okay, so how many of these out of these five we need to determine through our investigation? Did this actually impact the test results? Um, it was determined in this scenario through investigation that this impacted one customer's and uh, may have directly impacted the results submitted to that con customer. In this scenario, a fictitious ABC specialty is um, specified as this customer. So again, we talked about corrective and excuse me, a correction and corrective action. So in this case, uh, correction or remedial action was taken as the balance was taken out of service and determined that those results given to ABC specialty was not acceptable. ISO 17025 uh, accredited ACE Balance and Scale Company was contacted to service and recalibrate the balance. The lab manager informed the quality manager who contacted ABC specialty concerning a recall of their testing results due to this non-conforming testing. ABC agreed to resubmit a new sample. And so we have to uh, contact those customers that the work they may have impacted and if need be uh, recall those test results. Okay, moving right along with this uh, with this sample, uh, once a balance and scale service recalibrated the balance uh, in question and left it in an intolerant state, the balance was verified once again with the 100 gram weight in which a reading of 100.0000 or other words it was dead on was obtained and recorded in the equipment book. Uh, the lab manager met with the quality manager who was satisfied with the actions taken and allowed work to resume utilizing the balance in question. Hence, in this scenario, the quality manager is that individual who is uh, pinpointed as the uh, personnel who is the one who is um, authorized to resume work. The balance in question was placed back into service. QA manager gave his thumb up. Hence, work can now resume. Uh, the quality manager then instituted the corrective action procedure. In other words, in this particular scenario, this could happen again. Yes, we put a band-aid on the situation. We took the band we took the balance out of service. Uh, we had this, the uh, calibration company come in. Uh, Recalibrated the balance. Um, they then uh, re-verified it with their in-house weight. Everyone was satisfied. However, that's not to say this could, couldn't happen again. In other words, uh, John Doe proceeded to uh, to um, utilize the balance um, when it was obviously out of predefined conditions. So, hence, uh, corrective action procedure uh, was determined. Uh, through a root cause analysis that John Doe was unaware that the predefined limits set for the balances using the 100 gram weight, even though it was posted on the logbook. So in other words, we're, we're going to find out the, what the root cause of the issue was. John Doe is stating he was unaware uh, of the uh, predefined limits. However, they were clearly, uh, I'm not going to say clearly, that they were posted within proximity of that, that logbook. Um, corrective action uh, taken included the uh, retraining of John Doe. Uh, we don't know the history of John Doe. He might need more than that, but then just what's presented. And adding a column in the logbook specifying that the balance was or was not within the predefined limits. In other words, this is going to force any, any of the lead technician's hand in 
yay or nay that this actually fall within the 99.9995 and the 100.0005 grams specified. Um, so uh, that was determined to be, be the root cause of uh, the corrective action. Hence, if by doing this, hopefully, uh, by addressing the root cause, uh, this would greatly reduce the likelihood of this having to occur again. Probably would be a good item. This is sort of uh, pertaining to this balance, but carry it forward to all the other balances within the uh, within this testing lab if, uh, if predefined limits and these sort of checks were um, specified. So uh, we've uh, looked at the requirements. Uh, hopefully, in the, through this uh, example, was able to sort of crosswalk uh, those requirements over to, uh, to a real life situation. And uh, hopefully, uh, you all can uh, sort of uh, uh, relate to your own situations and thing that, things that you may have seen um, that may institute uh, non-conforming work i.e. Uh, control, um, excuse me, uh, quality control checks, intermediate checks being out, um, instruments being used um, when they were actually out of calibration, uh, um, technicians not following procedures. Uh, this reaches, uh, this brings us to the end of the formal point of this um, test, excuse me, of this uh, this webinar, uh, as always, I'm going to allocate some time for questions. Um, uh, you should have a space provided um, on your screen for submitting questions. Uh, give everybody about five minutes. If, if you have any questions, feel free to submit. I have some assistance at our headquarters up in uh, Troy, Michigan, where they will field these questions, and um, they will um, funnel them to me. So at this point, um, I will be quiet for the next five minutes. Uh, next time uh, I come on, um, I will uh, see what sort of questions uh, have come through and attempt to answer, um, answer them.
Okay, welcome back, everybody. Um, got a few questions here, but uh, before I proceed, I just want to uh, let you all know, <coughs> be aware that uh, we have already scheduled the webinar for next month, uh, which I believe is a Friday, the 20th of April. And uh, as you can see, uh, interesting topic. Uh, we keep uh, track of things at the PGLA from our assessments. And one thing that uh, we do keep tabs on is common findings, uh, various sections of the standard. Uh, um, we will probably break this down uh, for new labs uh, seeking accreditation. Uh, of course, it should be significantly different than uh, labs that are uh, um, established and are going through the uh, reaccreditation phase. Um, so uh, look forward to seeing everybody uh, next month. Um, we're looking at uh, getting the next couple scheduled real soon here and on our website uh, for you to look at the. Uh, um, things that are coming down the pike with uh, future webinars. Uh, let me uh, get to these questions here. Question one, uh, when an instrument is found out of tolerance and is calibrated, should it be removed from service during the investigation even if it was verified to be good? Uh, I'm not really sure I understand the scenario there. If the instrument is found out of tolerance, um, typically from that point there, the S found out, and that's how the calibration lab got it. So if you have something in place as far as verification, that's what I was resorting to during the uh, um, resorting to during the um, presentation with intermediate checks i.e. control charts. In this case, uh, let's say the, the scenario, and I, hopefully this is answering the question, the balance. Um, let's say, for example, you had that, that analytical balance set on a one-year calibration interval, but you have the intermediate checks with these class one test weights. Um, if ACE, uh, I believe the name was ACE uh, Balance and Scale Company came in there just to do their yearly calibration and the as found data was out of tolerance for that balance, if you were verifying that with the class one test weights, uh, that would mean uh, you would only have to uh, investigate as far as far back as there was an indication that the device was actually out of um, tolerance. So in other words, uh, if you had nothing in place during that year, like I said, the balance could have gone out uh, the day after ACE calibration, scale and balance calibration left, or it could have gone out the day before they got there. Without those intermediate checks and verification, there's no way of knowing. So if you have a good system in place for verification of the equipment used, then the answer, I hope I'm answering the question correctly, is, is is uh, uh, no, you don't have to um, uh, investigate that entire year. Just need to investigate uh, where your your intermediate checks would have determined where it could have possibly have been drifting and falling out. Just rereading this question. Okay, um, hopefully I did. Uh, there is a, on that previous slide an email address if uh, you want to uh, re-clarify the question if I didn't answer it. Uh, um, that email address there, webinar at pjlabs.com, um, would be sent to our office. They'll funnel it back to me with your contact information. Okay, uh, question. Does each uh, instance of non-conforming work require a corrective action request? Um, the answer to that is no. It just, uh, if you recall, uh, 492, section 492 requires, is the requirement for corrective action. And if it could, if it's felt it could reoccur, 
um, or if it is determined that the, uh, the lab itself is not complying with its own policies, procedures set within the quality management system, then, um, then yes, the corrective action, the corrective action procedure would need to, uh, would, would apply. If it's something, uh, let's say, for example, um, a test report uh, um, was issued and it had a wrong address on it. Uh, it's happened once. Um, you could the correction would be immediately, uh, of course, perhaps um, do an amended report and send it to the customer. Um, in that case, if for that uh, one instance and the likelihood of it reoccurring um, it is not very great and um, it's not really impacting the actual results, then uh, just a correction would be suitable, would be sufficient, um, and not corrective action. Again, refer to 492, you know, as far as what it states for crosswalking over to corrective action. Bear with me, I'm reading these off my cell phone actually. Question. I'll read this uh, again. I hopefully, I'm, I'm I'm not really familiar with with this particular test. Um, um, can you address how this applies to analytical instrumentation, uh, HPLC, for in, for instance? A yearly verification is performed by the vendor, but normally maintenance items are handled before before this verification is performed. Are system suitability checks equivalent to intermediate checks? Um, or is found in SF criteria only relevant to instruments that fall out of tolerance? I would say um, I would say yes to both of them. If it sounds to me like this is a um, if you have a um, suitably um, a suitable same as the, the the first question. Question actually, if you have a um, have a uh, system in place where you can um, have an intermediate check that um, that would show that the instrumentation, whatever happens to be, was operating within specified limits um, between cal between actual calibrations, that to me would be suitable for reducing, reducing that period that you need to do reverse traceability. Hence, if everything was operating when this was, um, that came through, excuse me, everything tested uh, positive um, during this uh, verification, and then the only, um, uh, more system suitably equivalent to intermediate, are the as found and as left criteria only relevant to instruments that fall out of tolerance? Yeah, so then hence if you're actually having a calibration afterwards of this equipment, then that would be be specified. Um, and let me just back up. I'm just I'm just thinking out loud here, sort of. Yeah, if your intermediate verification, if that's indicating also between um, cal between the actual calibration that something was um, out of tolerance or may something was not right that may have impacted the uh, the uh, customer's um, testing results then um, yes that would be a um, that would be a, a a reason to institute the non-conforming testing or calibration so um, even with the example I left that wasn't the actual this sort of crosswalk of this over to what you're um, asking here and hopefully hopefully I 
I'm on the right uh, track here. Um, that was not instituted because of uh, um, uh, the calibration. It was instituted because of the intermediate check with the test weights. Um, if the scale, if the um, and if the um, scale company came in and found it out of tolerance, uh, that that would apply then. But if you if they had a good system in place in this particular case with uh, class one weights checking checking them throughout the calibration interval, that would reduce the um, likelihood of uh, having to go back all year and do reverse traceability. Uh, again, um, I hope that that's the uh, that's it for the questions. Let me just double check that there. Yes. Uh, uh, hopefully, I answered the questions submit, uh, um, adequately. Again, um, if not, please uh, uh, contact. You can contact me directly through there. Um, and if it's a particular situation and particular testing lab that uh, I'm not uh, quite versed on, I, uh, I have enough resources at PJLA that uh, I would be able to, uh, to get the answer to you. Um, Again, uh, hopefully, uh, mark on your calendar April 28th for our next webinar. Be on the lookout uh, on our website for our next series of webinars uh, coming up. Uh, I want to thank you all for signing in today. Again, have, happy St. Patrick's Day. Um, so uh, I want to sign off and uh, hopefully uh, have you all back with us next month.